If you've spent much time in the world of native habitat management, you've probably heard of some individual plants being complained about on a regular basis. Most of these are invasive species, which makes sense. All of us native habitat managers are trying to remove them. But some of this dislike is directed at native species, like this tree growing here, the eastern red cedar, Juniperus virginiana, a common evergreen conifer tree that is found throughout eastern North America and into the central plain states. Eastern red cedar is a good looking tree that equals its good looks with its value to wildlife, as a host plant, and its economic importance in certain regions due to its beautiful multi-purpose wood. So why all the hate for red cedar? Well, it is a complex situation, and to fully understand why it is such a hot button species, we need to learn a bit about the natural history of red cedar and how to identify it when we encounter it in the field. Eastern red cedar is a pioneer species and can be found growing in areas that have been disturbed and have a good amount of sunlight reaching the ground. Places like fallow fields and pastures, areas that have been logged, places where a strong storm has knocked down the tree cover, roadsides and right-of-ways that are mowed on a long interval. Any place there is open ground with sunlight hitting it is prime real estate for eastern red cedar. I want to point out that eastern red cedar is another example of common name shenanigans. It isn't a cedar, it's a juniper as its scientific name suggests. True cedars are in the genus Cedrus and are native to the Western Himalayas and the Mediterranean, while the genus Juniperus is much more widespread and Juniperus species can be found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Eastern red cedar is our largest native juniper. See why I wanted to explain that name thing? It averages 30 to 40 feet tall with a 10 to 20 foot spread at maturity. When growing in the open with no competition for light, it tends to have a pyramidal growth form like a Christmas tree, which is a common use for them in the south. If it receives some shade, red cedar will tend to be less symmetrical and more open, but the growth form can vary quite a bit tree to tree, no matter how much light they are getting. There are also many cultivars of eastern red cedar that have been chosen for growth form and for color, so you may see some very different looking eastern red cedar in cultivation. As red cedar ages and gets taller, it tends to lose its lower leaves and sometimes even branches as they get shaded out. Red cedar has beautiful wood that has light colored sapwood and contrasting reddish purple heartwood. The wood is highly aromatic and rot and insect resistant and has been used for centuries to make fence posts and rails, outdoor furniture, siding and roofing shakes, closet lining, cedar chest, and is a source of cedar pet and livestock bedding. It is a quite versatile wood and red cedar is an important timber species across much of its range. Red cedar also has some great uses for habitat managers that I will get to in a bit. Eastern red cedar can grow just about anywhere and is adapted to a wide range of moist to sometimes dry, well-drained soils. The only soils it cannot tolerate are those that are consistently wet. It is our most drought tolerant native eastern conifer species and can be found growing on some rather poor, rocky soils that will grow little else. You may have heard of cedar glades, which are areas with poor rocky soils where the dominant woody flora is the eastern red cedar. The red cedars that grow in these glades are usually shrubby and small, even though they may be decades old. Yes, red cedar is one tough, adaptable tree. Although it can handle poor soil quite well, it does its best on moist, well-drained soils with a loamy texture. It is also salt tolerant, making it a good choice for planting near roads, driveways, and sidewalks that are being treated with salt during the winter. Red cedar does need access to full sunlight to thrive and is very shade intolerant. Once red cedar is shaded out by faster growing hardwoods or even other cedars, they rapidly start to decline and eventually die. An exception to this is when red cedar is in the seedling stage and competing with grasses and forbs for sunlight. At this time, it can handle the shade. After a couple of years though, it requires full sun to thrive. When growing in optimal conditions, red cedar has been known to live for up to 300 years. The leaves of red cedar vary with the age of the tree. Young trees, around three years or less in age, have all or needle-shaped leaves that are around a quarter of an inch long, feel prickly, and stand out from the twigs. The leaves are smaller, about 1 16th of an inch long, and scale-shaped on older trees. These scale-like leaves lie close to the twigs and seem to overlap like the scales of a fish. They also have a prickly or rough feel if you handle the foliage. Leaf color is green to blue-green. 
The foliage is dense and a healthy red cedar makes a substantial barrier to wind and sight, making them a great choice for a windbreak or visual screen. That dense foliage also has an impact on why red cedar is a problem in some situations, which I will cover in a bit. The leaf arrangement is opposite or whirled, which shows well in the scale-like pattern of the leaves. The foliage is also somewhat aromatic. Since red cedar is evergreen, there is no fall color, but as it sheds leaves, they turn a bronze brown before dropping. While we don't often equate conifers with a great food for herbivorous critters, there are some things that do chow down on them. Eastern red cedar is a host plant for the caterpillars of several Lepidoptera species, most notably the juniper geometer moth, the juniper hair streak butterfly, the curved line angle moth, and the impressive caterpillars of the imperial moth. Eastern red cedar is also a host plant to the odd looking evergreen bagworm moth, which is considered a horticultural pest to planted conifers. Although I do find them on red cedars, I never actually see them do any real damage to wild growing red cedar trees. Bagworms are easy to spot as the caterpillars make a distinctive bag from the foliage of the tree they are feeding on, which they take refuge in. Mammals tend to leave red cedar alone and deer only seem to eat it when there is little else to eat. Goats do have a taste for it though. The thick evergreen foliage creates excellent escape, nesting and resting cover for a wide variety of songbirds, game birds such as the northern bobwhite, and even owls. The monarch butterfly will also use eastern red cedar as a roost site during fall migration, which is something that is often overlooked when managing for monarch butterflies. A variety of small mammals from mice to rabbits take shelter around red cedar, as do larger critters like deer. As red cedar ages, it starts to lose lower limb density and its cover value decreases rapidly for ground dwelling birds and mammals. If your goal is cover for scrubland songbirds, game birds and mammals, or you need a short tree due to overhead power lines, red cedar can be kept short and bushy by clipping the leader out of the top. If you love nerding out about native plants, how to grow them, how to choose them for the biggest impact for pollinators and wildlife, and cool facts about them, and you want to connect with people who feel the same way and get some guidance as you travel along your habitat journey, then I encourage you to check out the Backyard Ecology Community. This is the place that backyard ecologists come together to make their habitat dreams come true, share in wins, and work through problems together, all without the negativity of traditional social media. Not only that, but members of the Backyard Ecology community have direct access to Shannon and myself, and we do two live virtual meetups every month where members can ask questions such as, what do I plant? When do I plant? How do I put in a water feature? Does Anthony own any other clothes other than to bees or not to be shirts? I know some of you are wondering. Seriously though, if you love native plants and creating functioning ecosystems on your property, even if you're just starting out, especially if you're just starting out, then the Backyard Ecology community is the place for you. It'll help you save time, money, and a whole bunch of heartache as you try to make your habitat dreams come true. I encourage you to check out the Backyard Ecology community. I will put a link for more information in the description. The bark of Eastern Red Cedar is distinctive. On younger trees, it is a reddish burgundy color and mainly smooth with occasional scattered shallow fissures. As the tree ages, the bark becomes more of a light brown to gray with reddish highlights and starts to exfoliate in thin, shreddy strips. This shreddy exfoliating bark makes an excellent fire starter, which is going to be important later in the video. The twigs of red cedar are rather fine and supple. New growth at the tips is bright green, often covered by leaves, and very supple. Older growth is reddish brown and mostly smooth, although there may be rough areas where old leaves persist. Something else you may see among the branches and twigs of eastern red cedar are the alien looking spiky orange fruity bodies of the cedar apple rust fungus that are emerging from fungal galls on the tree. This is a fungal species that requires two hosts to complete its life cycle, a juniperus species and an apple or related species. Those awesome looking fruiting bodies will release spores which can infect apple trees with cedar apple rust, which is not so awesome. While this fungus is best known for its impact on apple production, it can also infect other members of the rose family like hawthorns, quinces, and service berries. Something to keep in mind if you want to plant apple trees. If you love to learn about native trees and the interesting fungi that can grow upon them, then please go spread some spores on that like button. 
Eastern red cedar is a dioecious species, meaning that it has separate male and female trees. And as a conifer, it doesn't have flowers, but instead produces cones as its reproductive structures. The male cones, or the pollen cones, are small, around 1 8 to 3 16 of an inch long, yellowish brown, form at the tips of the small twigs, are quite numerous, and resemble miniature pine cones. They appear early in the year and can be seen from January through March with some variation depending on location. They produce a copious amount of pollen as most wind pollinated plant species do. The female cones or seed cones also form at the twig tips, are green to start and mature to varying degrees of blue with a whitish waxy cast to them and are around a quarter of an inch long. The seed cones look less like a pine cone and more like a berry especially as they mature. This is why you often hear them referred to as juniper berries. Which incidentally, if you crush up a mature red cedar seed cone, it may have a scent you are familiar with. They smell like gin, or more precisely, gin smells like juniper berries, as they are the main flavoring ingredient in gin. Which brings up a question. Do you like gin, yay or nay? Personally, it's not my thing. It's too much like drinking a juniper bush. If you don't drink gin or just don't drink, then drop a butterfly emoji in the comments and help this video get shown to more people. Thank you. Another thing you will notice when you mash up a seed cone is it contains one or two small seeds. This is the only way Eastern red cedar can reproduce and a healthy tree can produce a ton of seed. A single tree has been known to produce up to 1.5 million seeds in a good year. This is another factor that allows red cedar to become problematic in some situations. The mature seed cones are on the tree from September through February, with some variation due to location. The seed cones are eaten by a wide variety of songbirds, including the aptly named cedar waxwing, purple finches, and the pine grosbeak. An assortment of small mammals also consume seed cones. So we have talked about how eastern red cedar provides food and cover for birds and animals, is a host plant for some cool caterpillars, and a great choice for windbreaks and visual screens. So why is there so much dislike for this awesome native tree? Well, simply put, there is way more of it in certain plant communities than there has been historically, and it is causing some issues. The number one limiting factor to the survival of red cedar is fire. Red cedar is incredibly fire intolerant. It has thin bark that tends to exfoliate in highly flammable shaggy strips, and also has highly flammable branches that often grow to the ground, so when fire encounters it, red cedar becomes a tree-sized candle rather quickly. Prior to European colonization, eastern red cedar was much less common. It mainly grew in places where fire couldn't reach it, like on cliff and bluff faces and rocky outcroppings. Fire, whether naturally occurring or set by Native Americans, kept it from colonizing open areas like prairies, woodlands, and savannas. In our current world, fire has been largely removed from the landscape. We put them out when a natural fire starts, and we don't burn areas where the plant community requires it nearly as often as they should be. This has resulted in red cedar encroaching into plant communities that require fire to maintain them and keep the red cedar in check. The eastern edge of the Great Plains, especially in Oklahoma, is having a huge problem with red cedar encroachment into the grasslands where it has little competition and thousands of acres are now covered in near monocultures of red cedar. The southeast is also experiencing the same kind of phenomenon on a much smaller scale, but the results are the same. Not only do the cedars shade out the native grasses and forbs, but they also intercept an estimated 25 to 60% of the rain that falls on them. Remember that thick, dense foliage? Turns out it acts like a big green sponge, and the water it intercepts never makes it to the ground. It evaporates back into the air. This is causing issues with aquifer recharging in areas with large swaths of monoculture red cedar. Talk about a surprising hitting consequence of red cedar encroachment. I have a feeling as more research is done onto the encroachment of red cedar into these grassland areas, more ecological impacts are gonna be found. A few red cedars scattered through an open area is a good thing. They provide all the benefits to wildlife already mentioned, but large monocultures of them do nothing but lower biodiversity along with a host of other ecological issues. So what can be done about it? The simple answer is a whole lot of eastern red cedar must be removed. The easiest way and the most economical way to do this is with prescribed fire. 
This is feasible in some areas, but there are places where fire isn't an option. In those areas, mechanical removal can be used, either forestry mulching or cutting each individual tree down. There is a trait of the eastern red cedar that makes mechanical removal both simple and effective. If eastern red cedar is cut below the lowest limb, it will not sprout back. Herbicide is the last option, but fire and mechanical removal seem to be used much more often. Eastern red cedar is an excellent example of how too much of a perfectly fine native species encroaching heavily into an area where it was historically uncommon can lead to some serious problems. Eastern red cedar is one of those trees people tend to have a love-hate relationship with. People love it for its wildlife and host plant value and for its amazingly colored wood. And yet it can be a problem when trying to maintain and manage grass forb plant communities and a huge problem in the plains where it is spreading rapidly in dominating areas that have historically been grassland. Thankfully, it is one of the easier trees to control if you stay on top of things. There are many native trees people seem to have this love-hate kind of thing with, and one of my favorites is sassafras, which you can learn all about in this video, and be sure to take some time and enjoy nature in your backyard.